You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with the band Lest We Forget from Oxford in the UK. Their album Theatres of the Mind has been out for a while, but now they've been releasing singles. They've got Home, Visitors, and now their latest one, Messiah Complex, has been blowing my mind. So I'm really excited to be talking to these guys. You guys, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me, and welcome to The Pit. Thanks for having us, Nick. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should just go around and get everyone familiar with the sound of your voice. If you could just say your name and what you do in the band. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. So I'm JH and I'm the lead singer and bassist of Less We Forget. Uh, I'm Paul. I do guitars and some backing vocals as well. Uh, I'm Harry and I also do guitars and I'm not allowed to do backing vocals. <laughs> Strictly <laughs> forbidden. <Yeah. laughs> So my first question for you guys should be pretty obvious. Does it ever get tiring carrying around such giant balls? <laughs> you know, I'm pretty used to it. I've been doing it all my life. So. No, one's, no one's ever told me I've got balls. If anyone's ever heard me sing, they're always like, that guy has no balls. <laughs> No, but seriously, uh, I think for a lot of people, we understand, like, you guys started with uh, JH and Harry. You guys knew each other in high school, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, right. uh, yeah, we yeah we went to school together. And I think, like, we started an early iteration of this band when we were, like, 14, 15, something like that, um, which it, it was quite different to how it is now. Um, but, yeah, that, that, would, that would have been about 10 years ago. So, so did you guys both play instruments before you met each other or did you meet each other and then like the music and then that happened? So um, I, I played guitar before Let's We Forget happened. Um, and one, one vivid memory I have about the formation of the band is sitting on a school bus just in front of JH and just hearing, hearing him uh, sing Tears Don't Fall by Bullet For My Valentine. And I just turned around to him and go, I like Bullet For My Valentine. Let's hang out and, and listen to music. So that's how it started. Yeah. Um, um and yeah, like I, so I, um, when I was really young, I was a choral singer. I was a chorister. So I've been like singing for a, a, most of my life, actually. And I think like Harry plays a bit of piano. I've at some point in my life played a bit of violin. So like we've, we, we both been, um, we, we both got experience with musical instruments and been interested in, in music for probably the majority of our lives. But yeah, um, when we got into our teenage years and got a bit angsty and started listening to sort of metalcore, which was big um, when we were that age, um, we found that we had a shared love of that kind of music and then we started jamming and, and um, this band took form. So yeah, you guys had a shared love over metalcore and definitely when you listen back to the earlier stuff, it has a lot more of the metalcore influence. But how about for yourself, Paul? Because you showed up a little bit later into the band. When you started playing guitar, Paul, what was your first love? Uh, to be honest, it was, it was pretty much the same stuff, really. Um, just obviously we didn't know each other then. But, I mean, the very first thing was probably like uh, Metallica. I remember listening to um, like a classic like um, dad rock like compilation CD or something. Um, and, my, and Metallica came on and both my brother and my dad were like, God, what's this horrible stuff? And I was like, whoa, hang on. <laughs> I like this. What is it? Uh, and then, yeah, just progressed on to that sort of metalcore stuff as well in, doing my, in my own... Uh, yeah, my own little zone, and then so obviously met these guys many years after. How, how long ago did I join now? What, I think it was two, like, three years. Yeah, like the end of 2018 or something. Yeah, and obviously it sort of uh, started taking a new direction. I think we all started getting more into prog that sort of time anyway, maybe a bit earlier. But yeah. But in the early years of the band, back in 2012, you guys had a a big, uh, I mean, show with a grand fin- final on live and unsigned. Yeah. Do you guys remember oh, yeah. that what that was like? I mean, it was a while ago now, obviously, but looking back, what do you remember from that experience? I mean, I remember my voice cracking like 500 <laughs> times when we did. So it, like, it, was, it was so weird. So basically, like, the, the competition was I, I think it like it, it built itself as um the x factor for bands like unsigned bands and basically what happened is they had loads of regional quarterfinals and semi-finals so for us that was reading and that um that was the semi-final for like oxfordshire berkshire like this sort of area of the country so we played a couple of shows in um with sub 89 in reading which is a really cool venue it's like a probably like 200 300 cap venue um and the thing that we had to do was you had to splice one of your original songs and a cover together. 
Mm. So I think like we did that for, for the semifinals and for the quarterfinals. I can't remember for the life of me what the songs were that we covered or did. But in the final, we did um, one of our songs, a very old one. I don't think we ever released properly um, and don't think we ever should. And, <laughs> and, and, and we did Living on a Prayer. But the, like, the, the minute of Living on a Prayer that we decided to do was obviously the one that incorporated the key change. So, and we were like, we were really nervous. So the final, the final took place in the Proud Two, which is in the O2 Arena complex in London. So the O2 Arena, um, if you're not familiar with it, Derek, it's it's. I think it's probably the biggest non-stadium venue in the country. So it's like fifty thousand people arena venue, which used to be the Millennium Centre. Um, and the Proud Two was in the complex, and it was at the time I think it was like London's biggest club. It must have been like a six k cap, something like that. Yeah. And so we were really nervous. We only got like two minutes on stage, but we were really nervous the whole day. And I spent the whole day completely over-practicing to yeah. the extent that by the time I got on stage, my voice was gone. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I don't even know. There must be – the live video must exist somewhere. People can go find it. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's just two minutes of howling from me. Um, <laughs> How have I never heard this? I'm so going to uh, find that video. Because if you had it before, you would have left the band on it. I thought, like, um, yeah, that's true. Um, so that's like that's the fundamental memory I have of the day. But I think the whole experience was really cool. It was very cool. Yeah, uh, we've obviously uh, it was a packed like it was a packed out six thousand person something like that. Yeah, thousands of people there. Yeah, and it was it was nuts. Like we were only on there for two minutes. Um, but yeah, Pretty it's like hard. the biggest show we've ever played, and and will play for a, for a long time. So um, yeah, it was. We were just like sixteen year old kids just having a good time. Mm. Um, yeah, it was great fun, and like, I'm really glad we did it, even if I made a massive fool of myself. <laughs> <laughs> I watched the video, and I, I, I don't get that same impression from it. I thought you guys did a really good show. Oh, well, that's very kind. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> so then later on, uh, you, you guys had the first couple of songs come out with very metalcore influence. Then you had mm. a Sweet Serenity, and you yeah. guys got it mastered by Ackle from Tesseract. Yeah, yeah. How the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, he ru- he runs something called 4D Sounds, which I think, I don't know if it's like a physical studio, but it's definitely like his mixing and mastering service. So um, we we basically just sent him an email, like an ambitious email being like, do you want to master a song if we pay you money? <laughs> um, <laughs> and he got back to us and, and said he'd do it. And um, yeah, and, and, it, and it, yeah, it was a great experience. I think... He did some extra mixing on it as well, which was really kind because he just like enjoyed the track. Um, so yeah, it was it was really really good to work with him, um, and we were really really pleased with the product that came out of it. And obviously, every time we can possibly mention it, we do. Okay. Um, the fact that we work with him, so um, yeah, it was a great experience. I really recommend him for anyone that uh, anyone that um, thinks they have an opportunity to work with him in a mastering capacity. Um, but yeah, it was fantastic, and hopefully we can work with him again in the future. And now we got to get to theaters of the mind. This is you guys, you know, formed this band in high school. You put out some songs, then you went off to university. I, I kind of wanted. I was wondering, what where did you guys take in university? So I did English literature at Oxford University. Um, I did chemistry, uh, also at Oxford with JH. I did music um, way all the way in Worthing, uh, next to Brighton, completely. Not with these guys, but <laughs> yeah, that was good fun. Right, and so then after you guys felt like, let's make a whole album, and you guys put out a concept album, did you know for sure that's what you wanted to do? Like, we need to put out a concept album. So I I, I grew a love for, for bands like Dream Theatre and other prog bands that make concept albums all the time, and I thought, I want to try that, I want to do it. Um, so I wrote like the beginning kind of formation of, of theatres of the mind when I was at university. Um, and then when we were at university, the band kind of got put on the back burner mm. just because we were all separated and busy. Um, and then after university, we reignited it again when Paul joined. Um, and we, we came up with theatres of the mind, which kind of expanded on this small stuff that I'd written at university. Um, but yeah, we, I very much went into it thinking I want this to be a concept piece. Um, because it was something we hadn't really done. We'd done concept in songs, but never in collections of songs. So that was something we knew that we wanted to do. 
did you guys because now it's kind of been a trend of yours making stories fit the songs Mm -hmm. so is that going to be a trend for you going forward you guys think is it always kind of come naturally to just kind of make a story for the song i think it's something we always want to do isn't it um yeah i think we're, we're all sort of keen on the idea of having a narrative as well um with with the music you know just an extra layer i think isn't it i think mm-hmm. yeah, it's definitely the case that in any long form stuff that we put out so any eps or albums in the future they'll they'll focus on a concept and a narrative concept mm. specifically i think when we when we do singles it usually that's the way it falls we usually harry usually has a narrative idea or paul has a narrative idea in it and it forms a song and our songs tend to be you know a bit longer than your usual singles that tends to work quite nicely but i don't I don't think it's like a hard and fast rule that we'll always make sure that every single time we release a single, it will definitely be a story. It's just more often than not, that's how it works out. I think for albums though, we, we definitely, that's, that's an aspect of the band that's, that's original and, and keeps us fresh. So I think um, for, yeah, as I say, for any long form stuff, that'll probably be the way that we go in the future. And now I got to ask, how did you guys meet Paul? How did Paul, how did you meet the guys? Well, I, uh, I literally just responded to an ad one night. It's, um, it's as boring as that, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> um, I literally, I think, I think I'd had a couple of beers, as sometimes people do. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm really missing because I used to play a lot. I've had uh, other bands, and you know, music's a real big deal for me. Um, and I thought, you know what? I'll just have a look. I'll just have a look and see what's out there. And I saw this ad by these guys. It seemed really sort of professional. What they were asking was. Um, you know, fairly high end, um, uh, which is always a good sign because you know I didn't want to, you know, just jam around with whatever. Um, yeah, and then met these guys and I went from there really, and now I'm stuck with them. Yeah, he hasn't got a choice anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to touch on the fact that uh, I'm not sure how to say their name. Your drummer Des or Deck? They were Deck. Yeah. yeah well, and his departure uh, with you guys right now. Have you been auditioning any new drummers? Yeah, so we've um, basically like right before sort of the lockdown hit, we were um, well, we're still talking to him, but we were auditioning this guy, Oscar, um, great drummer, lovely guy, um, and we were ready to uh, do some a couple of shows with him. Like you know, we'd uh, we weren't saying anything in stone, like definitely joining. We were just gonna play some gigs, see how we all vibed, and you know, if that was right, we'd you know take it further. Um, but obviously, then you know nationwide lockdown hit and it's just put that on hold really but we still talk um he's still keen uh he's learned all the stuff you know so yeah. we rehearsed you know, we, we rehearsed with him once didn't we when restrictions um yeah were diluted back in sort of august 2020 um that was like the only rehearsal opportunity that we had but i think yeah like he's he's awesome he's a really good drummer and i think as much for from his point of view as from ours he just wants to play a few gigs with us, like do a couple of tours whenever we can reschedule them so that he can know a bit more and experience a bit more about what it's like to be in the band. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so all good signs and hopefully, fingers crossed, that's what comes to pass. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, yeah, I, I should touch on that. Obviously, it's the kind of the elephant in the room last March uh, when the unthinkable happened. And mm-hmm. uh, it was something that we all knew could happen and we kind of saw on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, but it kind of was kind of like two worlds kind of colliding together. Obviously, what I'm talking about is you guys did a concert with Ilo. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that like and obviously this was close to the lockdown too so what was yeah. it like doing that show oh it was awesome I, they they're a really cool um group of guys and yeah big big love for them the music and them themselves yeah we had a lot of fun, lot of fun. yeah it was fantastic i mean we played two shows in uh a venue called the star in guildford and scruffy murphy's in birmingham um and they're both like you know sort of 50 to 100 people I, the star's a bit bigger but um they they brought a decent crowd because they've done really well with that album release and um, yeah they were they, they were just really really good shows I think they were just really fun to be around they were very cool about everything because um, like low end tours are always a bit on the seat of your pants like you end up coming into a venue spewing all your all your gear everywhere and things sort of get sorted in time for the show so they're they're very free and easy about all of that stuff um, very 
very like fun and and interesting guys and they um yeah they were they were great to tour with yeah really professional performers as well they've got a really good setup they know they know what they're doing they're all you know very capable musicians yeah it was a joy it's a joy to play with them but what about the show itself well the show yeah the shows were good um i think they i think they actually um had a bit of trouble in the star one like getting um getting their sounds right or something but and they much preferred the the second one but um but overall it was really good uh, really good for us really good for them uh you know got some people yeah. doing a bit of moshing which is always nice to see so <laughs> they're, a very, they're a very tight live band and um yeah very good performers um really good at like replicating their recorded sound live so yeah it was you know like the, the good thing about like touring at our level is like you end up um seeing a lot of bands that you otherwise wouldn't have seen anyway because you play with them um so it's just really nice to to be able to be in two shows and and watch them as as fans um yeah it's was, it was fantastic it really can't um run out of superlatives for that that group of yeah. guys. tough act to follow man yeah were you guys worried that you would have to cancel any of those shows I th- I don't think for that one. I think um, uh, it's so long. Like, t- what is time now? Um, <laughs> but I think that, time has no meaning. Yeah, I don't think there was a like that was back when like Boris Johnson was you know ah uh, shaking hands with COVID patients in hospitals. Like there was no real um, indication yeah. that, that that like a UK lockdown would happen. So I think back then it was it it didn't look like those shows were going to be cancelled. Um, and then obviously like within a span of 10 days, like everything had shut down after them. But I don't think we really thought about that weekend of going off. Yeah. I think on the, it was on the night, um, Scrappy Murphy's, wasn't it? On the night, there was a bit of an air. Yeah. And there was a, there was a feeling that, you know, after then, it, you know, it was, it was happening, like, or it could happen. So there was a bit, yeah, it was a bit strange, I have to say. Yeah. And that was it. That was the last, that yeah. was the last gig, wasn't it? Last yeah. Gig yeah. Made, yeah. God. Horrid. <laughs> so throughout uh, all your recordings it seems like when i look at it, the credits jamie mcintyre has been there always for to record with you guys so at this point is jamie really just like another member of the band well he used to be a playing member of the band so um he he's a school friend of of harry and i's um so we he he started the band with us basically and um he very early on in the band just decided to get into producing and he's just got better and better since then. Um, he moved up to Manchester for university um, and took all his like production gear with him and decided to set up as a, as an independent producer up there. Um, which meant that, I mean, that, that it's about three hour drive away from where we are. So it was, it was a bit untenable for him to be up there and us to be down here in terms of him continuing as a playing member of the band. But um, so he stopped doing that, but um, continues to produce all of our music. Um, and still one of our best friends in the whole world. So, um, yeah, he's he's a really really good producer. Um, it's yes, yeah, good to have him on board. And in regards to what you said, like a member, he, you know, he kind of is in a way. Like he's, um, you know, he's got a really good ear, um, really good eye for you know good stuff. So, you know, gives us advice on parts and yeah, it's a, it's a good asset to good. have. Us being really close as well means that he doesn't hold back when he has criticisms or yeah. things to add to our music. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, we 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 butted heads over a couple of things, that's for yeah. sure. So uh, I want to know a little bit more about your guys's artwork because uh, Lee did the video for Messiah Complex, the lyric video, right? Mm. Yeah. So um, yeah, so he's a a video producer based in Guildford, I think. Um, so not too far away from us, but we yeah we like I, I think one of the things that we're really keen on as as a band is to work with like similarly ambitious people who have a real drive to like make their way in the industry. So we try to um, keep like close working relationships with other people that, that go into and are very important in building the business of a band. So like photographers and producers and, and artwork and artists and, and video editors. So Lee's one of those, one of those people and we're, you know, he's done some really good work for us. So um, it's great to, to have that working relationship and the artwork itself i think um we've used quite a few different people just because i think when it comes to artwork it's good to have that kind of breadth and uh of 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 eye and 
and differing styles and we're not one of those bands that goes like right well this album has to be like this and this this album cover has to be like this but they all have to be like in one overarching style we're not like weezer with different colors um we we're very much like you know if it looks good then then happy days and it and it fits with the theme of the of the track and the music then then fantastic so i think since zero one we've used three different artists i think we use one for zero one and theaters of the mind and then have since used um one for visitors and one for messiah complex and they've all you know they're all very different so um yeah it's, i think we're we're really proud of our artwork and the people that have worked on it you should be <laughs> thanks <laughs> so uh has it been hard for you guys to be creative in the middle of all this? I know it's obviously hard for you guys to meet together, but if you have a, a lot of ideas to still like share, send to each other over the net and kind of work on. Yeah. I think for me, it's been, uh, it's been patchy. Um, I think there have been large portions where, you know, the sort of the lockdowns getting me down a bit and I'm struggling to find any, uh, inspiration, but then I've, um, it's gone the other way and I've sort of, you know, I've, I've pushed myself to do it and, you know, I've come up with a couple of songs um, during the lockdown and we've got some ideas that we're throwing back and forth at each other. Um, we've pretty much got two singles um, ready to record, so, um, or perhaps uh, songs for a new new album. So there is some in the works, but I say, yeah, it's, it's been it's been on and off, depending on how much I can motivate myself. I assume similar for the guys. But. Yeah, we've got pretty accomplished on um, virtual Zoom call, vocal writing and stuff like that, um, which is yeah interesting. Probably not something we'll be doing in two years, hopefully. But yeah, I, we, we've we've done our best to keep active, and I think one of the things that we've we've done is is really upped our social media output and our digital output um, to try and really engage people on those platforms since we can't engage them in the live music space. Um, so that's, I think that, and also trying to write as much as possible and have as much in the bank for when recording becomes a possibility again, and when we have the ability to tour to promote a single release or an album release, um, has been really important. So yeah, we've been, it's a lot of behind the scenes work. There's not so much, you know, Hey, we've been recording today or Hey, we've been rehearsing today. Um, cause that just can't happen, but yeah, we've been trying to keep as active as possible. I like to, uh, I like to reminisce about concerts. Yeah. <laughs> so would you like to like go over some of your favorite concert memories with me? Oh uh, man, have I told you about the time that I butchered Bon Jovi? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we've, I, I think some of the best ones for me have been, we, we play the O2 Academy in Oxford quite regularly and mainly because like we can always get a, a big crowd turnout there and a really good response. And it's usually just something to like ground us. Cause we, we spend, you know, in non COVID times, we spend quite a lot of the year touring in places that that aren't necessarily that familiar with us. And you, that's kind of the grind of being a band, I guess. But yeah, doing the odd show back in Oxford in like a, a decent sized venue that we can pack out has been really, really, they're, they're always really, really good fun. And we always get a really good response. So um, yeah, the O2 show that I did with you was, uh, was great fun. Yeah, I tend to really enjoy those. Um, I think. One of the one of the standout memories for me for the year, I think the the big year that we did touring before um, lockdown, so twenty nineteen, was we played a gig in in Chesterfield, which is like the north end of the Midlands. It's like quite a good way away from us. And usually, what you like we expect being like an underground prog band, um, we'd never played that city before. Usually, like you get the punters that come into the music venue like every weekend, and maybe you know some people you usually get a a couple of support bands who are local so like their fans will come in so you're not really expecting to play to people who have come to see you you're expecting to play to people who haven't heard you so that you can get your name out there but i remember that gig very vividly because after we played there were several people that came up to us and they were like yeah we you know we're fans like we we've listened to your music on spotify we really like you guys and we came to see your show here we were really glad that you came up to play here and that was really awesome like um we found that that happened more and more towards the end of, of, of 2019 um, and, our, and our gigging schedule that year. So, yeah, that was really special, I think. Yeah, it's always nice to have uh, some confirmation that you're actually not shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, because, you know, you, you, you're doing it and you're thinking, well, we like it, but does anyone else? So yeah. when, you, when you meet some genuine fans, it's uh, that's always a highlight for sure. 
How about you, for Harry? Any memories? I think um, for me, the Star Show that we did uh, did with Ilo. Um, is sometimes when you play a show and you think it hasn't gone that well, you think maybe you messed up. You think maybe the sound wasn't so good. Um, and then after the show, people come up to you and just say how much they enjoyed it and how incredible it was. And that a couple, a few people who I think came to see Ilo came up and said that to us afterwards. Oh, that, was good. that was really, really nice to hear. Yeah, uh, both those shows are really good, actually. Um, and as Jay said, yeah, so we played uh, an O2 show. Ah, oh, we played an O2 show with a Limp Biscuit cover band. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> called Stiff Biscuit. Um, and that was hilarious and really, really fun and also completely full. Um, yeah, it was just yeah, that, was, that was just a really fun night. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's some of my memories. Yeah, I think there's there's one other one that really stands out to me, which is we played a venue that got it's had quite a lot of publicity in lockdown because it's been one of the champions of like the Music Venues Trust, which is a charity here that makes sure that um, that music venues have a have a means of survival in the UK, um, and that's the Waterloo Music Bar in Blackpool. We played it uh, in the summer of 2019, and it's like it's a decent sized venue. I think you get bands like, um, you know, your sort of levels of like Death Havana or a few of the like up and coming metal bands um, in the UK playing there. It's like a decent sized venue, and we had a, a really good, a really good, like incredibly responsive crowd. And Blackpool's like five hours away from our hometown, um, and I think like it wasn't a full venue, but it was damn close. Um, mm. And yeah, just like seeing people like really enjoying playing um how you're playing and like um responding to the music and engaging with the music is is always great but like when it's four hours away and there's no one there that you know and they're still doing that it's pretty pretty cool yeah that was a good one that was, mm, cool. that was a really good venue as well mm. what advice would you give to someone who's just trying to pursue their dreams <sighs> never give up <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I, th- I, I, I think perseverance is key, really, to be honest. I mean, That's nothing's, good. you know, it's not going to go your way all the time or, you know, perhaps even not very often. But, you know, you've really got to stick to it. You've got to, if you, if you really, really love it and you really want to do it, then just go for it. You've got, you've just got to keep going. I mean, you, you may never get to the level that you, you want, but you'd kick yourself for not trying, right? Yeah, that's the thing. And I think, I think another thing I'd say, like, particularly in the, in the, the music business at a low level you i think you need to not be stubborn i think it's important because you get loads of bands being like oh i'm not going to do anything on instagram like we're just going to release cds at shows and um we'll play like a few shows a year but yeah that's all we're going to do um because that's the way that it always used to be i think it it just doesn't work anymore i think embracing new ideas and trying out new things is also really important if you're really serious about um pursuing your dreams and and ultimately like making it big in a creative industry yeah you've got to adapt my, don't you i think my one's similar to what jay just said um which is to be open to criticism um because at the end of the day like if you've, ri- you've written the music exactly your way but if people don't like it then no one's going to listen to it so if people have comments about your music take it on board you know adjust and learn um yeah that's mine really be, be open to constructive criticism harry that's a terrible idea <laughs> that's very wise i think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm used to a lot of criticism from paul so i've had to take that on. yeah yeah i've been grinding him down over the past <laughs> few years is there anything else that you guys would like to say to our listeners uh just thanks for tuning in um we're we're on spotify we're on apple music uh we're on youtube we're on basically any digital streaming platform that you can think of so um we'd be incredibly grateful if you could go and listen to our music um that's the thing that keeps us going these days um and i'd also just say if you could just check out our website www.lessweforgetband.co.uk uh we've got bios up on there we've got pictures we've got videos we've got all of our show announcements and music there as well so um yeah, we'd be really some, grateful just to... Some lovely T-shirts. And some mm. lovely T-shirts, <laughs> which we do ship to British Columbia. Um, <laughs> nice, yeah. nice, good plug. Yeah, yeah, just, um, just, just, yeah, um, just checking us out would be awesome. But, but a stream, um, a like on any of our social medias or, um, yeah, a follow would be fantastic. Yeah. And if you're a fan of proggy metal stuff, you might like our 
might like our content, so... Well, you might not, and that's okay. You might not as well, that's fine, but, (laughs) you know. Be open to constructive criticism, that's what Harry always says. (laughs) But yeah, thanks for... Like a wise old owl. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for for taking the time to to listen to us talk. It's not easy, so... (laughs) Yeah, thanks very much. You've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been talking to Paul, J.H., and Harry from the band Lest We Forget. Thank you guys so much for taking time to talk to me, and hopefully we'll do it again in the future, okay? Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Derek. Cheers, Derek. Take care of yourselves. You too, man. Thanks so much. <laughs>